This evening we're going to be looking at one verse in Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews is a book that, as you know, is one of my particular favorites. It seems like we keep coming back to it because it is so full. But um, I'd like to read for you to introduce this, um, the the, the 14 verses of Hebrews 1. But we're really just going to look at um, the ideas that are contained in verse 14. The reason why the author to the Hebrews brings them up in the first place is to show us how much greater Jesus is. Uh, than the angels. But let's not forget there are angels and they do have a purpose and that's what we want to look at this evening. So this is what we read in, in Hebrews 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers, in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. And when he brings again, or when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds, and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they all will become old like a garment. And like a mantle you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will also be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? I pointed earlier to the fact that uh, the psalmist talks about the angel of the Lord and camps around those who fear him, pointing out that the angel of the Lord is God himself. Well, here we see, of course, the Son being called God, being called Lord, being called Creator, being worshipped by the angels. Again, all these reasons why we believe that Jesus is God in human flesh, just, again, for that apologetic uh, Uh, element, as it were, in this text. But again, let's focus tonight on the angels. Now this morning, remember, we saw that John showed us God's mercy in that he sent an angel from time to time to stir up the water in the pool of Bethesda to grant the gift of healing to those who first got into the pool, whether it was one or perhaps more than one at a time. The author to the Hebrews tells us that angels are ministering spirits spiritual beings that God created that serve him. And the way they serve him is by ministering to those who will inherit salvation. That is, they were created to minister to you and to me as we travel through this world on our way to heaven. Uh, Basically, we have a lot of things to face that aren't good. A lot of trials, a lot of difficulties, a lot of battles. But the angels are there to help us. They're another blessing that God gives to us to safeguard us on our way. So this evening what I'd like us to do is just spend a little bit of time considering you know, what the angels are. And then secondly, what it is that they basically do. What are the blessings that God provides through them? So first of all, what, what are the angels? Well, the author to the Hebrews tells us that they are spiritual beings He says in verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits? So angels are are spirits. They're they're basically, as I've said, they're called spiritual. Now, 
First of all, what this means is that, that angels do not have physical bodies. Angels are immaterial. Uh, to get philosophical, that means that they don't have any extension in the physical universe. And what that means is simply they don't take up any space. Uh, you know, I, you've probably heard this before, but there was this medieval debate, or at least I've, I've just read recently, it might have been something that never actually did take place, although when I was in seminary, it was certainly believed that it did. A medieval debate between two, we say, scholastics, men who were interested in getting down to the very nuts and bolts of, of theology. They, they had this question that they were debating. How many angels can sit or dance on the head of a pin? Now this, as Bob Godfrey told us, wasn't a meaningless question. It actually did have a very important purpose. It had to do with the nature of angels, what it means that they are spirits. Now Aquinas believed that the answer was an infinite number of angels can fit on the head of a pin for the simple reason that they are immaterial. They don't take up any space. Now I know that may be hard to understand or maybe hard to accept because of what we see in Scripture because oftentimes we see angels not just, well, when we see them represented. They're not represented as invisible beings so much as tangible beings, uh, beings that you can see, uh, maybe even touch, maybe an angel that has a sword that's inflicting some damage. They seem to be physical enough. They seem to be tangible enough. But we need to understand that even though they can take this form, it doesn't change their nature. They are spirits. They are not physical beings. Now there's another sense in which angels can be said to be spiritual. And I think it's maybe it's actually something I never even thought of before, but I think we should think about it. Uh, and that is that angels are filled with the Spirit of God. The difference the Bible says between a spiritual man and a natural man is, is really this one thing. One has the Spirit while the other one has nothing of the Spirit. Uh, Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verses 12 through chapter 3, verse 1. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. Basically, what Paul is saying here is there is a large difference between a natural man and a spiritual man. Uh, the natural man doesn't have the Spirit of God. The natural man doesn't understand the things of God. doesn't mean that he can't understand what the Bible says, but he doesn't understand the value of, that we put on it because we see it as the Word of God, they see it as the Word of man. But the one who has the Spirit sees the value of the Word, reads the Word, and follows it. The difference is one has the Spirit and one doesn't. Well, the difference between the holy angels and the demons is the same. One has the Spirit and the other does not. That's what makes the holy angels holy, is that they have the Holy Spirit. What makes the demons to be evil is the fact that they do not have the spirit. I, uh, I believe, as, as others believe, that evil is really the absence of good. We want, we want to try to understand how did evil come into the world. If evil is something, if it's a, a substance, if it's a thing, then somebody had to create it. Well, God is the creator of all things. Does that mean God created evil? Well, no. God didn't create evil because God is good and he doesn't tempt anyone to evil. He is not the author of evil. So what is evil? Well, if, if it is in fact the absence of good, that explains, of course, how it comes about. Now, why would we believe that? Well, we could ask the same question about cold. 
What is cold? Is cold a thing? Actually, cold is the absence of heat, isn't it? It's the absence of heat energy. And it's not really something different. It's just simply the absence of something. Well, basically, evil is the same thing. Now, the Spirit is the love of God. The Spirit is the goodness of God. Without the Spirit, what is there? In the absence of love, there's basically only evil. You know that man was made good. He was made in the image of God. But what happened when he sinned in the garden and lost the Spirit? He became evil. He lost his original righteousness. He lost his desire to love and serve God. And he became a sinner, which is why he felt naked, why he felt exposed, why he hid from God was because he understood something of his guilt. He understood that he had lost something, something that made him pure, something that made him holy. He lost the spirit. When the angels sinned, they also lost their goodness. They lost the spirit. Now those that didn't sin still have him, and that's why they're still, still called good, why they're still called holy. So basically, um, you know, the idea here is that angels are called spiritual because they are spirits, and, and they're also spiritual because they're filled with the Spirit of God, and that would pertain all, only to the holy uh, angels. Now, as to when God made them, when did God make the angels? We're not actually told precisely when he made them. There's nothing in Scripture that references God made the angels. But we can, I think, figure it out from the creation account. I believe that they were made on the very first day. Moses writes in Genesis 1.1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. I believe in this passage we actually have the creation of the angels. Now this implies that in the beginning only God existed. And being the only being who was present, he acted to bring into being everything that there is. God spoke and he said, let it be, and whatever he commanded leaped into existence. Now, I do know that Meredith Klein is a controversial figure, at least some of you are aware of some of the controversy shrouding him, but I don't think that everything that he said was necessarily uh, incorrect. I think he had a lot of things to say that were helpful. Now, uh, Meredith Klein believed that Genesis 1-1 spoke of the creation of the angels, and he believes it for this reason. When Moses said that God created the heavens and he created the earth and he separates those two things, we see that the next verse in verse 2 basically says that the earth was formless and void. Darkness was on the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And then over the next six days we see the Lord bringing, as it were, form and order and shape to that which was formless and void. But it's the earth, you see, that is said to be formless and void. And yet, when he's shaping the earth and everything that has to do with it, it also includes the celestial heavens, the stars, the moon, and, and the sun, and, and all of that. That seems to be included in, in the earth. And so Meredith Klein believes when it says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, that the heavens here may have actually been referring to the place where God himself dwells and the heavenly host. Now we do know that the angels at least were in existence while God was shaping uh, the earth and bringing form to it because we read in scripture that the angels or the sons of God rejoiced while God was working and, and Jesus was, as it were, next to him rejoicing as a master craftsman as he looked at the work that was being done. As a matter of fact, he was the one uh, doing that work. But the, the sons of God were there and they rejoiced at the creation. So basically, the angels were created very early on, I believe, during the creation week at the very beginning so they could see the rest of what God was doing and they could, as it were, marvel at God's creative power. Now, we, we know from Scripture as well that the angels are made in the image of God. Now, we often think that's something that purely has to do with us because we are also made in the image of God, but I do believe God made the angels in His image as well. He may not state that explicitly either, but he does tell us what that image is, what it is in us that is like God. It doesn't have to do with the way we look. It doesn't have to do with the fact that we have two arms, two hands, so many fingers and toes and so forth because God is a spirit and he doesn't have a shape like this. He's an infinite spirit. 
Uh, so there's no form. And if we think God's in the human form, we're, we're really mistaken. So what does that image actually consist of? Well, it has to do with our souls. It has to do with the spiritual part of us, with the fact that we are rational beings. That, that is, we can think. We are moral beings. We make morally significant choices. It has to do with the fact that we're immortal beings, that you and I are ever, never actually going to exist. We can think. We have the capacity to be moral, and we will never cease to be. Now, the Bible, more specifically, narrows down the image of God to the moral likeness of God in righteousness, holiness, and truth. That's what Adam and Eve were like when he first created them. They had a love for God. They had a love for what is good. That is something, of course, as we understand, that they lost. Okay, that was lost in the fall, but something that is regained through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are again being fashioned into the moral image of God. But these other elements, the ability to think, the ability to be moral, and that we're immortal, those are things that are true of us, whether we're Christians or not. So man is still in the image of God, even if he isn't a Christian, but Christians have this part of the image that was lost by Adam and Eve being restored in them. That's something the Spirit of God does as he refashions us into the image of Christ. Now we ask the question about angels. Can angels think? Are angels moral beings? Are they immortal? Do, especially the holy angels, do they love what is good and do they hate what is evil? Well, everything that is true about the image of God is true about them. So who's to say that they're not made in the image of God? They are very much like we are, only, of course, much more powerful. Now, we see in Scripture that there's different, there's different kinds of angels as well, and this is kind of an interesting study. There are the cherubim who guard the holiness of God. These are the angels that God placed at the entrance of the garden, which was his sanctuary. It was heaven on earth, the place where God dwelt. So that when Adam and Eve sinned, they wouldn't be able to come in and violate that holiness. They could no longer be in the holy presence of God. So they guarded the holiness of God. When God told them to build the Ark of the Covenant, he had them put a cherubim or a cherub on either side of the Ark with their wings stretched over the mercy seat, which was a symbol of their guarding the holiness of God of God. So there's the cherubim. And then there's also the seraphim, those who stand in the presence of God, those who are ready at all times to minister to him, those who are sent out to render judgment at his command. Their name literally means fiery ones. Now there may be other angels as well, but these are the only ones that are actually uh, the only groups of angels that were told about in Scripture, except perhaps for thrones and dominions, principalities and powers, which seem to refer to different stations or ranks of angels. Lucifer was an angel. He appears to have been the greatest angel before he fell. Certainly there were none higher than him. Since his fall, Michael appears to be uh, singled out perhaps as the greatest of the angels, or it depends on how we view Michael, as you know, some see him to be actually the Lord Jesus Christ, but I don't know that that is the case. Um, he's at least one of the greatest, if not the greatest. He's called in Scripture the archangel, which literally means the chief angel, and yet we also find him in Scripture being called the uh, one of the chief princes. In other words, he may be one of a group of greater angels that basically surface above the rest. Jude writes in Jude, um, well, Jude verse 9, But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Could be that Satan was mightier than he was, or it could be their equals, but certainly it looked like Michael didn't necessarily want to tangle with him. But he says, The Lord rebuke you, and that's all it took to finish him off because there, there may be a comparison between Michael and, and Satan or Lucifer, but there's certainly no comparison between Lucifer and God. Now we also read in Daniel 10.13 where Gabriel explains to Daniel why it took him so long to come and answer to his prayer. 
But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, which we believe is Satan, was withstanding me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. So here, Michael appears to be stronger than, than Gabriel, or at least both of them together could, could take him on so that he could be free to come down and bring the message that God had sent Gabriel to give to Daniel. And why did God allow Gabriel to get sidetracked? It must have been God's will. He wanted Daniel to wait, and he wanted Gabriel to fight with the prince of darkness. Now we know from the scriptures that when God made the angels, he made them all at the same time. Something that isn't true of us, by the way. As human beings, we are made to procreate. That's why if, in the plan of God, which we know he did, we were to be put on trial at one time, it had to be done in one man, basically at the beginning. It had to be done through Adam. Because if that wasn't the case, if God simply put us on trial as we were successively born, we'd be living in a world where there was those who were fallen and those who were yet to fall, assuming that we were all going to make the same choice that Adam made. Now, it's a little bit of speculation there, but God gave us a perfect representative. That perfect representative sinned in the garden. He made a choice that I think we all would have made, being perfect human beings in the same garden. So God put us all on trial in one man at the very beginning because all the human race did not exist at one time. That's why he did it representatively. But angels, on the other hand, we are told in Scripture, don't get married. And they don't have children. And I don't believe the sons of God that cohabited with the daughters of men were angels cohabiting with human women, but rather the godly line cohabiting with the ungodly line. And the church was in danger of being extinguished, which is why the flood came. Angels do not have the ability to procreate. So because they don't have children and they were all created at the same time, God was able to put them on trial all at the same time. And he didn't have to do it through a representative. He could do it through each of them personally. Now Edwards, as I've said before, believed that the test that God gave the angels was whether or not they would continue to follow God once they learned that they were created to be the servants of mankind. Now just, you know, think about this for a moment. The angels who were so great in power, so great in their intellectual ability, so great in their love towards God, so great in, in their, their physical strength, even though they're spirits. There was one occasion when an angel went out and killed 185,000 men in one evening, and I'm sure... It wasn't difficult at all for the angel to do that. Perhaps it was one of the seraphims, since they're the fiery ones. But these great angelic beings being told, as God reveals their, his plan to them, that they would have to be the servants of man who was much below them, as it were. I mean, the author to the Hebrews, quoting the psalmist, tells us that they were made man. We were made lower than the angels. And yet, someday, because of Christ's work, we would be greater than the angels. Well, the angels couldn't deal with that. They couldn't stomach it, apparently, and certainly Lucifer couldn't because he became prideful and he fell and he became the devil. And I think we should assume from Revelation 12, 4, when it says that the dragon drew with his tail a third of the stars and cast them down to the earth, that he took a third of the angels with him and they became demons. They chose to disobey God. They chose to side with Lucifer and they were cast out of the presence of God. They lost the Holy Spirit and they became simply evil. Now we do read in scripture that there are also, that the angels, the holy angels, are called also the chosen or the elect angels, which leads us to believe that God had even his election among the angels, that in this rebellion, which of course was a part of his knowledge and plan, that he would reserve two-thirds of the angels to be ministers among mankind. So as God is said to elect or choose among fallen mankind as to those he would redeem, so the Lord is said to have made a choice among the angels as to which ones he would not allow to fall away from him in that rebellion that Lucifer led. Paul writes to Timothy, in 1 Timothy 5.21, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels 
to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. So angels are spiritual beings. Angels are filled with the Spirit of God. They are said to be not just spirit, but spiritual in that sense. They are holy. They love God. They were created all at one time. They are like us in the image of God. They are made to be ministering spirits, to render service to those of us who will inherit salvation. And that's what we want to get to second. What is it that angels do? And here is the encouraging part, if we're not already encouraged. Uh, well, first of all, we know what the unholy angels do. The unholy angels take their orders from the devil. They fight against God and his people. We saw this morning they're involved in afflicting people, inflicting mankind with suffering and disease. They are undoubtedly behind a lot of the evil that's going on in this world. I mean, Satan is said to be the prince of the power of the air, the god of this world. And he has control over a, a third of the angelic population, which are now demons. And they do a great deal of damage in the world as they seek to lead people away from God. That's what they do. But we need to recognize that they are on a chain, as Satan is on a chain. They can only do what God allows them to do and nothing more. You'll note, remember in the case of Job, that in order to touch Job, in order to afflict Job, Satan had to come to God and, and he actually is represented as having access to heaven. And I think he did at that time. And I don't know if he does anymore or not, but uh, at that time he certainly did. And he asks God permission to afflict Job and God gives him permission. And again, we read that and we say, Lord, why are you giving Satan permission to afflict Job? Is that what you do to your people? Sometimes he does. But whenever he does, he does it for good and he will not allow Satan or any of the demons to destroy you. There's also a case in the Bible where Jehoshaphat and Ahab were together and uh, Ahab called all his prophets together and, and they were all telling him to go into battle against the, the foe, the common foe that uh, they had closed ranks, that is Ahab and Jehoshaphat closed ranks to fight. And as all these false prophets are prophesying. Jehoshaphat says, isn't there a prophet of God anywhere that, that can prophesy in his name? And Well, there is one, but I don't like him. You know, he always prophesies against me. Well, don't say that. Bring him here. Let's listen to what he has to say. And the prophet says, go into battle and you'll succeed. And, and Ahab says to him, how many times do I have to tell you to speak nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? He says, go into battle because God has determined that tomorrow you're going to die. And Ahab says, you see? He never says anything but evil against me. And, and then that particular prophet told him what was behind the false prophets. There was a meeting in heaven. And God had the angels in front of him. And he says, who will entice Ahab to go into battle tomorrow so that he will die? And an angel appears and said, I will do it. He says, I will be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of his prophets. Now, how could a holy angel put lies into the mouth of a prophet? or any of these false prophets. Uh, we, I think we are to believe, and I think many believe that that was really one of the fallen angels, like, like Lucifer, like Satan, that the Lord uses for his holy purposes, in this case, bringing judgment against Ahab for his sins. So that's what the unholy angels are doing. But secondly, what we're interested in is what are the chosen angels doing? Those that didn't fall, those that are holy, like the one that came down and stirred the water at Bethesda. Well, in some way, all the angels are involved in ministering to the saints, in ministering to us. The author to the Hebrews writes again in chapter 1, verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? That's what they were made for. That's what they do. So what exactly is it that they're doing? Well, they're all involved, at least at some level, in our lives. Now, I do think that angels are involved, we might say also, in the lives of those who don't inherit salvation. Okay? Now, here it says specifically they're involved in our lives, but I do believe that they're also involved in the lives of those who never will come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. For these reasons, Jesus said in Luke 6, verse 35, But you love your enemies. 
and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. The psalmist writes in Psalm 145, verse 9, The Lord is good to all, and his mercies are over all his works. In other words, God is good to all of his creation, and he is good to all the creatures that he has made. And that includes even the ungrateful and evil. And I think that it means that sometimes God even grants to the mercies that we don't often think about, maybe some of the mercies that he might grant to his own people. I mean, it shouldn't surprise us that sometimes he may send his angels to minister to unbelievers. Have you ever heard a story of somebody who was definitely not a Christian who talked about some miraculous deliverance? How did that happen? Well, sometimes they're just being deceitful. But sometimes things like that really do happen because God is merciful, because God is gracious, because he is good. But one thing we do know for certain, and that is the angels are involved in our lives, and that's what our passage tells us. Again, they're sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. And I think they were doing this before we came to Christ. Now that we have come to Christ, they're going to be with us in death. And they're also going to be with us, ministering to us and with us throughout all eternity. Have you ever asked yourself the question, how did you ever survive from the time you were born to the time you came to Christ? I mean, I think we all have at one time or another, haven't we? Well, certainly the Lord had his plan to preserve us until he brought the gospel to us and sent his spirit to save us. But can we say that he didn't use his angels to bring this about? I mean, what about all those close calls that we've had to face? Now, I don't have any examples necessarily from you, but I have plenty from my own life. I mean, there was a time when I was walking in the mountains when I was just a wee lad <laughs> with my dad. And we walked by a rattlesnake that was coiled and ready to strike. It was only about two or three feet away. My dad picked me up and we just were whisking down the path just instantly. But how did we make it out of his grasp? Was there an angel involved in that? One time we were walking on a path that suddenly pitched to a 45 degree and down below was about a 50 foot drop to the boulders. Why didn't we slip and fall into that you know, abyss as it were? Um, there was a time when I had scarlet fever. Why did I survive? I mean, do you ever ask yourself questions like that? We've all had times like this, I think. There's been times when we've all had to face death or at least come close to death God says his angels are ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. So even before we come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the angels were involved in our lives protecting us, serving us, ministering to us, keeping us out of danger. Not completely out of danger, but at least to that kind of danger that could destroy us. Now since we've come to Christ... The angels minister to us as well. Now, when we first came to Jesus, the Bible says that the angels actually rejoiced. You know, the, the, the Bible says that the angels are really intrigued by the whole idea of salvation, that they long to look into what the Lord is doing. And we also read that when one of Christ's sheep, for whom he laid down his life, is brought into the folds, that the angels actually Rejoice in heaven over that. Uh, we read in Luke 15, verses 8 through 10, Or what woman, Jesus says, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I mean, they were made for this purpose, right? To minister to those who will inherit salvation. Well, one of those is brought savingly to their master and Lord whom they love, and they know of Jesus' love for that sheep. They rejoice with him, as well as the Father and the Holy Spirit over the salvation of that soul. Since we've been the Lord's, the angels have been there to protect us. And again, we have many examples in Scripture of how God sends his angels to protect them. 
Remember, they went down into Sodom to bring Lot and his wife and his daughters out of that city before God destroyed that city. When Jacob was on his way to Paddan Aram and concerned for his life, he had a dream and he saw a ladder extending into heaven with the angels of God ascending and descending, showing that God was sending his angels to protect him and would watch him along the way, not only to Paddan Aram, but also on his way back when he was returning from from there to Canaan, he was concerned that uh, his brother Esau was going to kill him because, remember, he stole his blessing, which wasn't the right thing to do, but it was still God's plan, and God used his sin for good purposes. But when he was on his way back, it says that he met the angels. And in this place where he saw the angels, he, he named that place Mahanaim, which means two camps. There's our camp. And there's the camp of the angels that God has sent in order to protect him. And again, we see angels working in the lives of God's people throughout Scripture. Can you think of times when the Lord, again, protected you since you became a Christian? You know, I have that one particular event in my own life, which I've shared before, about driving down the freeway in a truck that was, had 5,500 pounds of salt on it. And as I was driving, all of a sudden, the wheel started shimmying like this, and, and you know, the steering wheel. And the, the front wheel, the tire, the wheel, the brake drum, and everything just stripped off the spindle, just all in one shot, came off. And suddenly, the truck was down on the ground, and it was out of control. It wasn't spinning, thankfully. But then suddenly, there was this, this thing that came from the side. I, saw, I just saw the thing shoot off like that, but... I saw this thing come back in front of the truck, hit the truck, the truck suddenly propped up like this, and I was able to control the truck and pull over to the side halfway across the bridge where it had about at least a 75-foot drop. And somebody pulled up behind me and said, I just, I can't believe what I just saw. <laughs> Basically, the, the wheel and everything stripped off, hit, hit the guardrail, came back, went underneath the front axle right around the, the, the brake shoes and cradled the wheel and, and gave me control of the truck. It happened so quickly, I hardly knew what was going on. But did that happen just by chance? Or were those angels that caused that to take place? Well, again, I think we all have our stories of what the Lord has done. God says he made these angels to minister to those who inherit salvation. They're here. I had a, a Christian friend years ago who used to uh, say there was a, a threshold when you're driving down the road a threshold at which the angels would fly out of your car if you went too fast. I, I, don't, I don't think that's the case. I think perhaps more of them actually join you the faster you go. <laughs> because the Lord is merciful, right? Now, angels, I believe, certainly fight against the demons continually to keep them from injuring or destroying us. Perhaps that's one of the ways that God limits their abilities. And they may even be sent in answer to our prayers as Gabriel did for Daniel, only when they, as it were, communicate with us, they don't do it in a verbal way, but perhaps show us things from the Word of God or perhaps lead us in different directions, perhaps you know, causing us to go this way instead of that way. It's, it's hard to say what the angels may do. But they're involved in our lives. The Bible also tells us that after death, the angels are actually going to convey our souls into heaven. Apparently, God isn't just going to transport us, as it were, from earth to heaven, but he's going to send angels to, to take our souls and to convey us into glory. Maybe the journey from here to there is going to increase our love and our admiration for God as we get to see more of his creation than we've ever seen before. Now, Jesus, in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16, verses 19 through 22, tells us that that's what the angels do. Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. So apparently not just one angel, but at least two. And the rich man also died and was buried. Now again, Abraham's bosom was not in the depths of the earth. Abraham's bosom is in heaven because that's where Abraham was when he died. You know, the work of Christ brings the souls of those who 
trust in him immediately into paradise, immediately into glory when they die. But he does it by way of the angels. And once you're in heaven, the Bible says the angels are still going to minister to you, at least by way of fellowship and by worshiping with you as you worship with them in heaven. We read in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 through 24, when contrasting the Old Covenant with the New and what Mount Sinai was like versus what Mount Zion is like now, which is a picture of heaven. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who were enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. I mean, it tells us here that the spirits of righteous men made perfect, which are those who, who die and, and go before us into heaven, are there with myriads of angels in heaven worshiping God. You know, so we get to worship with the angels. We, we get to interact with the angels. We get to fellowship with the angels. Now, how are we going to be able to do that if they're spirits and they're invisible? Well, we've already seen that they can actually reveal themselves in a variety of ways, but we need to understand that we're going to be spirits too, aren't we? Disembodied spirits, at least for a while, while we're in heaven, until the Lord comes again to bring an end to human history and raises our bodies for the final judgment. But yet, they appear to be able to see each other, you know, the spirits of righteous men, and, and they can see the angels, so we shouldn't have any difficulty with that. As a matter of fact, we're going to be able to see something much greater than that. We're going to see the Lord Jesus Christ seated, seated at the right hand of the Father, and or at least of God. I, I believe that certainly the Son of God exists outside of that human nature, but we're going to see God too. It's called the beatific vision, God and all of his glory in heaven. So we're not going to be that concerned about seeing the angels, but we will see them, and it will be a wonderful thing. So tonight, I just wanted to go through these things to encourage us. Let's be thankful that God has made angels and that he sends them to help us because we need them. Let's not use them as an excuse to, to do, maybe as some do, you know, to do crazy things. Some people say, you know what, I'm immortal until God says otherwise, so I'm just going to put my life at risk and he's going to send his angels to help me. We need to realize that that is putting the Lord to the test. Remember when Satan took Jesus up to the pinnacle of the temple, the highest point on the temple, and he said, throw yourself off. Because it's written in Scripture that he will give his angels charge concerning you. We read that in Psalm 91. Uh, and they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus said, it's also written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So the angels are there to protect you, but they're not there as a safety net for the crazy things you might want to do. And hopefully we don't want to necessarily do any crazy things. The ones, those of us who are younger might be more tempted to do that than those of us who are older and understand a little bit more of our limitations. But let's also be careful to live as the Lord calls us to live because of the angels. Remember, the angels also watch us, don't they? I mean, if they're going to be sent to guard us, they have, to be, they have to see what we're doing. There's, there's a passage in Scripture that talks about the head covering for the, for the woman and how the angels, you know, that, that the woman should wear the head covering because of the angels. And that's kind of an interesting thought there. I, I heard it explained one time, and it sounds reasonable, that the angels were there when, when Eve rebelled against the Lord, when she cast off uh, the Lord's authority and her husband's authority, and they saw that. And in those days, of course, the woman would wear the head covering if she were praying or prophesying in public. And if she were to cast that off, it would be to cast off the authority, and that would be offensive to the angels. That's what Paul says. And he says we, we should be careful, you know, not to offend the angels. It's because they're watching and, and they're seeing us, seeing what we do. So we need to make sure that, that um, we're aware of that that the angels are also watching over us to make sure that we do the right thing, to make sure that we stay on the right path that the Lord has called us to walk on because that path is the only safe path. And so the angels are going to watch over us to make sure that we stay on that path because they are here for our safety. 
So remember, there are angels. Be thankful for them. And be careful how you walk ar around them because they may actually interact with you to make sure you stay on the path. They may be actually one of the means that the Lord uses to discipline us so that we get back on the path and we stay where we are safe because of God's mercy. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and, and let's ask the Lord or actually thank the Lord that, that he has done such great things for us in giving to us such good friends as the angels uh, to watch over us and to guide us safely to heaven.